Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion was released on June 13th, 2018. Up until now, Splatoon's single-player offerings have been a fun diversion from the main content, but make no mistake, Octo Expansion is not good for a bonus mode or good as a diversion. Octo Expansion is just plain damn good. I won't bury the lead here, I think Octo Expansion is the best single-player content in the series, and I think it holds up as one of Nintendo's best Switch titles. Is it as good as Super Mario Odyssey? Probably not, but I like it as much as I like Super Mario 3D World or Bowser's Fury. The DLC costs $20 and is these days bundled together with, I hate saying this name out loud, Nintendo Switch Online Plus Expansion Pack. The DLC is a whopping 80 levels of extremely high quality. 80 levels might sound like a lot, and it is, but the levels themselves are much shorter than Octo Canyon's were. If I count all of my time in Octo Expansion this run, except for the Inner Agent 3 fight, which we'll talk about later, then 100%ing the game took just over 7 hours. The longest of the campaign so far, but not dramatically so. Octo Expansion switches perspective from your regular Splatoon 2 character to an Octoling waking up deep underground in what's called the Deep Sea Metro. Unlike other Octolings, though, you aren't evil because, and this is true, you were present at the concert given by the Squid Sisters at the end of Splatoon 1. The song performed there, the Calamari Incantation, was so good that it caused many of the Octolings who heard it to turn good. I find this really silly and charming. If Splatoon were a game that took itself at all seriously, I wouldn't like this, but it doesn't, so this works for me. It also feeds into something pretty fun from the game's multiplayer, or I suppose the lobby of the multiplayer, the character of Marina. Pearl and Marina, who as a duo are referred to as Off the Hook, were introduced as the replacement idol characters for Splatoon 2, the characters who introduce what multiplayer maps and modes are active every time you boot up the game, or when the rotation changes, like Callie and Marie did in the first game. Something players picked up on the moment Marina was introduced is that Marina isn't an inkling, she's an octoling. The only not evil one we knew of until Octo Expansion was introduced. Pearl and Marina are absolutely my favorite characters in the Splatoon series. As opposed to being based on J-pop idols like the Squid Sisters were, Off the Hook are meant to evoke hip-hop culture, which I think is really neat. These games feel like a celebration of youth culture in a way that somehow manages to avoid being either cringy or patronizing, and exploring a different kind of youth culture between games was a smart way to give each a distinct feel. I haven't actually talked about the music of Splatoon all that much yet, but it's worth talking about here because it's one of the most important things about the series in my opinion. One of the things that makes Splatoon, Splatoon. Every song on Splatoon's soundtrack is credited to in-universe bands or groups. The best examples of this are the Squid Sisters, Off the Hook, and Deep Cut, the announcers for the three games respectively. But there are other bands named in-universe, usually with a pun in their names, like Seaside, High Tide Era, or Omega-3. What's really impressive about this is that they give each named group their own distinct sound. All of the music in Splatoon has this really unique style. There's an... the only word I can think of to describe it is aquatic sound to it. Like, sometimes it almost sounds like you're hearing the vocals really distantly reverberating through water. It's really neat. I've heard Splatoon's music described as squid punk before, and that's a good way to think about it. Still, all the bands in the game sound unique. If you listen to a Squid Sisters song and then listen to an Off the Hook song, you can tell that they are musically distinct, evoking the original styles they're based on while still sounding distinctly like something from another world, another culture. 
This music is more thought through than you might realize just from playing the game. For example, there are official lyrics available for many of the songs in these games, despite the actual songs you can hear in-game being in a made-up simlish. In Off the Hook's lyrics, Pearl's lines are all written in hiragana, while Marina's are all written in katakana. In a Famitsu interview, it was stated that this is to emphasize that, in-universe, all of Marina's lines are in a different in-game language, her native Octarian tongue. All of this, the unique feel to Splatoon's music that sounds unlike anything else I've ever heard, the commitment to making up a backstory for in-game bands that wrote every track, the thought put into the little details that make each song, each group, have a distinct sound. This is some of the best world building I've ever seen in a video game. This is what makes Splatoon, a franchise where we've actually seen very little of the world up to this point, feel so much bigger. Splatoon feels like a coherent, cohesive world. You're not just playing Splatoon, you're going there. You're going to Inkopolis or Splatsville, and as you run down the streets that are essentially a multiplayer menu, it feels like you could keep going and each and every street block would be fully realized, even though that's not true. It's just so impressive. Not to mention that all of the music in Splatoon slaps. Like, this is an S-tier soundtrack, no further questions at this time. Pearl and Marina don't feature at all in the Octo Canyon campaign, so there wasn't much actual story to them until Octo Expansion. But here, we get introduced to them as major characters fairly early on. Characters on the surface you're communicating with as you try to escape the Deep Sea Metro. This is great, because they're both terrific characters. Not just character designs, but characters with interesting stories, particularly Marina. They also get new outfits in Octo Expansion, which I'm told are explicitly based on Tupac and Notorious B.I.G., who were part of an infamous East Coast-West Coast rivalry. I say I'm told because I don't think it'll surprise anyone given the everything about me to know that I'm not really well-versed in rap culture. Totally respect it, not dissing it or the people who care about it at all. I think it's a really cool thing for Splatoon to have directly referenced here, but I don't know much about it. The source I'm getting this from in the description. Two other recurring characters show up in this, with the return of Cap'n Cuttlefish, who is stuck inside the metro with you, and eventually the return of Agent 3, the player character from the first game. In order to avoid making a canon depiction of Agent 3, they actually let you customize the character partway through the game, in order to have your Agent 3 show up at the end. The Octo Canyon storyline mentions that Captain Cuttlefish and Agent 3 are away on other business, so this expansion serves as a way to give us an idea of what they get up to when Kelly and Marie aren't around. Separated from Agent 3, however, Captain Cuttlefish soon appoints you as Agent 8, and the two of you work together to escape. The Deep Sea Metro functions as a series of trials being organized by a mysterious voice on a telephone who says that you are applicant number 10,008 to attempt to enter the Promised Land. In order to enter the Promised Land, which Captain Cuttlefish and Agent 8 assume means to escape the Metro, you have to traverse the Metro and gather the four Thangs. Notably, you're not fighting regular Octarians like you were in the previous two games. Rather, you're fighting so-called sanitized Octarians, who have been converted into a zombie-like state by the mysterious organizers of the Deep Sea Metro Test, the Kamabo Corporation. They are a sickly neon green and blue hue, instead of the more natural colors in the first two campaigns. Deep Sea Metro does not have a hub like the sectors of the first two games. Rather, you're progressing along a subway map one level at a time. Something really awesome about this is that you're not required to approach the levels in any specific order. 
The campaign is completely non-linear, and it's up to you what order you want to progress through the 10 rail lines available. You start out with only the yellow line accessible, but will quickly expand your map in your search for the four Thangs. You don't need to complete all 80 levels to finish the story either, which is nice, although the levels are strong enough that they're all worth playing through, and you get rewards in the multiplayer for completing each line. While the hub for Octo Expansion is tiny, only a train car, one of the most memorable things about the expansion is how the passengers of the car change every time you load back into it. You can see some really strange character designs built around weird sea life. The creatures above ground are already a delight to see, but here in the metro, we get to see far stranger creatures. These creatures are called denizens of the deep, and while you never interact with them directly, they're always eye-catching and delightful. The Splatoon fan wiki has an article about the different designs and what real-life sea creatures inspired them, which is an excellent read if you get a chance. Two of my favorite designs are the blobfish and the ping pong tree sponge. Splatoon has always done an amazing job at suggesting a larger world through relatively few interactions, and seeing these denizens of the deep go about their daily routine is perhaps the best example of that yet. It suggests an entire civilization thriving down here below the surface. One thing Octo Expansion does better than any other campaign in the series is vibes. Whether it's the train car, an underwater seaweed forest, or even the abstract floating platform zones many of the levels still take place in, there's something really appealing about existing in these spaces, just hanging out here for a while. The dark, neon-lit, graffiti-filled aesthetic of the expansion gives the campaign a really unique place among the series, a different edge to its art from the Nickelodeon skater punk core appeal of the main game. One character you interact with quite a bit over the course of the campaign is a giant isopod named Isopadre. Isopadre was another applicant who failed the Deep Sea Metro test chambers, and as a result was stuck endlessly riding the rail. He's been down here for so long that he's lost almost all of his memories of life before the Metro. Whenever you finish a level, you get a mem cake, a little eraser made of so-called compressed memories of test subjects. On their own, each of these mem cakes is a cute little chibi render of a character or object from the game. But when you complete a set from each of the game's 10 rail lines, you can take it to Isopadre and exchange it for an item unlock in the multiplayer mode. Another character you interact with quite often in the campaign is the Conductor of the Train, a sea cucumber named Sea Cucumber, which is adorable. Sea Cucumber is in charge of taking applicants from trial to trial, and rewards you with points each time you discover a new line. Speaking of those points, they're a strange, somewhat pointless system. Every level in Octo Expansion has a point cost associated with attempting it, and you're rewarded with points each time you beat a level. You'll have to spend those entrance fee points again if you lose all of your lives during a level and want to continue. The weird thing about this is, you quickly end up getting so many more points than are needed to spend that it's extremely unlikely that you'll ever even get close to running out. Even though Octo Expansion gets pretty difficult, you'd have to get stuck on missions dozens, if not hundreds of times by the later game in order to actually run out of points, and the points aren't used for anything else, which makes the entire system feel redundant. Adding further to this, Octo Expansion adds a skip mechanic. Not only are not all levels required to reach the end of the game in the first place here, but after you've died a certain number of times in a level, Marina will offer to hack into the Deep Sea Metro's systems and skip the level for you. This doesn't give you the level's mem cake, but it will let you progress. If you ever do run out of points somehow, then you can take out a loan, dropping your point total into the negatives, but allowing you to continue playing. 
The only thing having debt effects is preventing you from accessing the game's secret boss fight. But again, I feel like you'd have to be trying really hard to ever drop into the negatives. Octo Expansion's levels do not allow you to bring any weapon of your choice into them. Rather, each level has a set weapon or a set of weapons to choose from. This was a great choice, because it means each level can be properly built around a specific playstyle. Beyond that though, there are now even levels built around using a specific super or a specific sub-weapon. The breadth of creative ways the levels can be built now that the developers know exactly what approach or approaches will be possible has absolutely exploded. Something a bit surprising is that Splatoon is done hiding collectibles inside of the levels themselves now. There are no collectibles in Octo Expansion other than the mem cakes you get for completing each level, and Splatoon 3's campaign will hide collectibles inside of the hub world rather than the missions. I like this change. Collectibles can be fun, but not when it feels like they detract from my ability to focus on playing the level for its own sake. And in Splatoon 2 especially, that's exactly what it felt like. I wasn't playing a level trying to beat it, I was meticulously poring over every inch of the level looking for secrets, which made it hard to appreciate the levels themselves. The downside to this is that there's really nothing the developers can hide in obscure corners or down extra paths now, aside from more points, which, as we've mentioned already, are worthless. The levels here are absolutely worth appreciating for their own sake, though. There are some extremely creative mechanics and level ideas. One mechanical highlight are the 8-ball levels, which are scattered throughout the campaign and ask the player to escort a large 8-ball through the mission without dropping it off of the platforms. Each of these feels unique and creative, and it's a blast to figure out how the 8-ball interacts with other mechanics in each. For example, the ball will stick to certain platforms, instantly stopping all momentum. The campaign also features several super creative levels, ones which it feels shocking Splatoon is able to support as well as it does. One of the 8-ball levels later on is a limited ink level that plays on a giant pool table, where you have to use your limited ink to bank several balls through goal hoops. Another level has you playing Space Invaders, as Octarians slowly approach. Still another has you playing Breakout. These all work shockingly well, and it shows that the Splatoon team have honestly brought their A-game to the gimmick levels this time around. The levels imitating PvP matches are also greatly improved. Each is built around one of the main game's ranked modes, like Tower Control, which is Splatoon's version of a payload mode, or Rainmaker, which has you bring a powerful rocket launcher type weapon to the enemy base. These maps place you against a series of Octolings, as you must complete these ranked mode objectives by yourself. By virtue of playing against AI, these missions are still easier than a ranked match would be, but I really like these as a sort of tutorial that can familiarize new players with the ranked mode gameplay, and I wish these had been in the base game. There are new versions of the four boss fights from the Octo Canyon campaign, with DJ Octavio being the only boss from that campaign who isn't reused. This means that Octo Stomp is the only boss featured in all four campaigns, although he functions quite differently in Splatoon 3. These remixed bosses are all fun, but the two I really like are the remixes of the Octo Samurai and Octo Shower bosses, because these both exclusively use specials in an interesting way that makes the fight much harder. The Octo Samurai fight puts you in a very small arena in the Baller Super, which makes the fight very difficult. You can't take damage directly while in the Baller, but the Samurai's attacks can now easily rocket you off of the stage, so you have to be careful about finding openings to attack, as even getting hit once can easily kill you. 
The Octo Shower Fight uses a jetpack special, which actually makes things more difficult, as you can no longer rely on using the cover around the stage nearly as easily as you once could. It's impressive that they've found a way to make levels where you're given unlimited super more difficult by virtue of the supers being so ill-fitted for the arena you're using them in. Not all of Octo Expansion's missions are aiming for challenge, though. One of my favorite level types introduced here are box sculpting levels, where you're given a large pile of boxes on one side of the arena and a blocky sculpture on the other. Your goal is to carefully destroy the boxes in the pile until the boxes and the sculpture are an exact match. Break even one wrong box and it'll cost you a life. I really love these missions. They're not hard at all. If you take your time with them, they're extremely easy. But I find them relaxing. And there's something very satisfying about sculpting out a pile of boxes into a recognizable shape. As you progress through the lines, you unlock chat logs between Pearl, Marina, and Captain Cuttlefish, which includes some neat lore details. It turns out people in Inkopolis haven't caught on to Marina being an Octoling yet, and you get some interesting details about how worried she is that people will cast her out when she's discovered. I love how they actually rendered images and messages popping in as you scroll through these logs. That must have been much more difficult to render in an authentic way than just having them display normally would have been but it adds so much to the vibe of hanging out in an old chat room, something which I assume the younger target audience for the game wouldn't have any frame of reference for. While the main story of Octo Expansion is more concerned with Agent 8 and Captain Cuttlefish's escape, and ultimately a very big and sinister plot that could destroy the world, the chat logs are cool because they tell a much more personal story about Pearl and Marina and their relationship. Marina, much like Agent 8, turned good upon hearing the Calamari incantation performance at the end of Splatoon 1, and you get some details about her life before that as well. It turns out she wasn't just any Octoling though. She was a very high-ranking engineer in Octavio's army, responsible for maintaining the great Octo weapons, as well as being the inventor of some of their devices like the Flutters, the showers that chase you around in some of the missions we've seen since the first game. Unlike the other campaigns in the series, Octo Expansion does actually have a message, a theme it's communicating. It's still Splatoon, it's not overbearing, but it's definitely there, a theme of acceptance of others. Pearl was one of the first people Marina met after coming to the surface, and before long the two had formed a band. While the idea that the citizens of Inkopolis, and especially Pearl, never noticed that Marina is an Octoling, is silly, it also leads to this really nice exchange between the two after Cuttlefish shows Pearl his own profile on Marina from the new Squidbeak Splatoon. Pearl says that everyone will love Marina after she's revealed to be an Octoling and accept her, and indeed, that's what happens. After the events of Octo Expansion, all of the Octolings who had been living among Inkopolis citizens in secret are revealed, and everyone's cool with it. Because these Octolings who wanted to move away from the abandoned underground ruins and quote-unquote oppressive Octoling society are just like everyone else. This is a really innocent, perhaps naive, way to imagine how something like this would play out, a vilified group of people suddenly attempting to join a society, but that's precisely what I like about it. Splatoon is a game for kids, and the message here really does boil down to a positive one about not judging others for their physical appearance or heritage. That's a good message to give kids. This theme is echoed by the campaign's main antagonist, Commander Tartar. So let's talk about the ending and Tartar's motivations. As you progress through the rail lines and gather the four things, you may notice that they're each a piece of a blender. 
Indeed, once all four are collected, you return them to the telephone at the station, only to see them reassembled into a completed blender. The telephone tells you and Captain Cuttlefish to enter the blender in order to be taken to the Promised Land, only to reveal, once you're inside of it, that he's going to puree the two of you. Luckily, you're saved at the last moment by Agent 3. Unfortunately, Agent 3 is knocked out in the process. The telephone is actually Commander Tartar, an AI created by humans, specifically by a professor. It was actually confirmed in another Famitsu interview that Commander Tartar was created by the same professor who saved Judd. So that's a fun piece of trivia. Commander Tartar was created to pass down human knowledge to whatever species may come next, but after thousands of years, Commander Tartar became corrupted. It hates the Inklings and the Octolings, their love of pointless games and fashion and their disdain for each other. And so, it has decided that instead of passing human knowledge on to the new dominant species, it would create a so-called perfect life form, the sanitized Octarians. It now plans to annihilate all life on Earth and repopulate with its zombie-like perfect creations. As Agent 3 is now incapacitated, you have to attempt to stop Commander Tartar yourself. This begins a lengthy ending sequence, eight missions which are not counted in the 80 mission total I mentioned earlier. Each phase of this has a different idea at its heart, and they're all really interesting. You begin without any sort of weapon at all, and must play the first mission as a stealth section before slowly getting your weapons back as you progress. These missions actually reference Metal Gear Solid, specifically the way Pearl will shout, Eight! Eight! If you die. This might seem like a weird one-off reference, but there's actually a likely reason for it. One of the developers for Octo Expansion is a man named Jordan Amaro, who previously worked for Capcom on Resident Evil 7 and Kojima Productions on, you guessed it, Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain. I mostly mention this Metal Gear Solid connection because I know it's going to bug my brother out when he hears this. That's right. I know you're watching. The video is aware of you, and is talking to you directly now. Brother, are you afraid? You should be. Hello? The second part of the escape sequence is largely about using enemy ink to your own advantage. In several places, your path is blocked by crates which need to be destroyed, but without any way to attack, you must lure enemies into attacking the crates for you. This is another really clever way of using Splatoon's mechanics in a counterintuitive but fun way. The third mission is all about navigating moving platforms. First, ones which are falling downwards and must be climbed and jumped across, and then staying alive while riding a series of slow moving platforms, while being bombarded by a distant Octarian's attacks. One of the coolest parts of this escape sequence is the fourth mission, where you have to carefully dodge lasers while making your way down a hallway, a classic spy movie sequence which, again, you wouldn't expect Splatoon could support, but which works surprisingly well. The fifth mission is one large platform with several switches that must be inked and then grabbed in order to move pieces of the platform and allow you to progress further. Using an unlimited inkjet special weapon, you have to find all eight switches and figure out how to reach them in order to move on. The sixth mission then requires you to carefully escort a power core on a moving platform through a gauntlet of enemies and obstacles. This is the trickiest part of the whole ending sequence, in my opinion. The platform moves forward as you ink the core, so you have to carefully move the platform forward at appropriate times to dodge missiles. As you progress through these missions, you hear Captain Cuttlefish and Agent 3 get ambushed and captured by Commander Tartar's forces. This leads to the game's penultimate level, a boss fight against a mind-controlled, sanitized Agent 3. 
This fight is fairly tricky, as Agent 3 has access to a wide range of weapons and specials they can spam much more frequently than a real player can. The fight plays out in four phases, with Agent 3 switching weapons out each time. It's one of my favorite types of boss fight, where you're fighting an upgraded version of a character similar to your own. The Lady Maria of this game, if you will. Each phase of Agent 3's fight uses a beefed up version of a different special weapon available to the player. In the first phase, Agent 3 uses a curling bomb launcher. After this, Agent 3 will use the baller, which can be tricky since they're immune to damage until it's detonated. In phase 3, they'll use a stingray, and finally, in phase 4, they'll use the splashdown alt several times in a row. Once you eventually take the sanitized Agent 3 down, you get a fun little interface moment as the game plays the interface's animation for when you take out a player in multiplayer. The most memorable part of the entire campaign, though, is the final mission. Commander Tartar pilots an enormous human sculpture to the surface, which opens its mouth to reveal machinery and some sort of large laser cannon. The statue is going to destroy Inkopolis in just minutes, but Marina discovers that the statue is powered by sunlight, and so if the entire thing can be covered in ink, then you'll be able to stop it and Pearl will be able to take it out with her killer battle cry. This plays out in a really fun sequence where you traverse the exterior of the statue on grind rails, hitting hyper bombs, giant versions of the suction bombs available in the game's multiplayer, which are here thrown onto it by Marina. The timer here is pretty tricky. You don't have a lot of chances to make mistakes. Once you finally cover the full thing, the game does another fun little interface trick here, where it plays the Turf War victory sequence, but as Pearl screams the statue to its destruction, the meter explodes in victory for the player's side. Once you've beaten the campaign, you get a cinematic credit sequence where you can watch Pearl, Marina, Agent 8, Captain Cuttlefish, and Agent 3 look out over Inkopolis. Agent 8 and Captain Cuttlefish having finally escaped to the surface. It is a little bit of a shame that this doesn't have an interactive credit sequence like the other campaigns do, but it's hardly a big deal. Beating the campaign gives you a couple of unlocks, like the Octo Shot in multiplayer, but most importantly is the ability to change from your Inkling player character to play as an Octoling in multiplayer instead. This represents that Octolings have finally come to the surface and been accepted by the people of Inkopolis, and later Splatsville. But there's one more thing you can still do in Octo Expansion. Once you've beaten all 80 levels without having Marina clear any of them for you, and have completed the ending sequence, you unlock one last boss fight, a rematch against Agent 3 called Inner Agent 3. In universe, this is contextualized as the player remembering fighting Agent 3 years earlier at the end of Splatoon 1's campaign, that they were a generic Octoling present at the final boss fight with DJ Octavio. So you're fighting Agent 3 at the height of their power, instead of the weaker mind-controlled version you'd fight in the ending sequence. I'm at a loss for words for this fight. All I've got is... The true Demon Souls starts here. It's five phases, and each phase only takes maybe 30 seconds or so. A successful attempt would only take two, maybe three minutes. I spent over two consecutive hours fighting this boss to get footage for this video. Back when Octo Expansion first came out, I bounced off of this boss fight hard. I spent maybe a half hour trying it and decided, no, I think not. So for this video, I decided the time had finally come to dedicate myself to clearing this thing. I did. I did it. I got the golden toothpick, the reward for beating it. The biggest problem you face in this fight are the auto bombers, little robot bombs which Agent 3 will throw that follow you and attempt to detonate on top of you. Unlike fighting a real player, Inner Agent 3 can throw autobombers a lot. 
The third phase is the one I find trickiest, because they get the ability to throw basically infinite auto bombers during it. You can't get rid of them other than letting them explode. Shooting them does nothing, and the hitbox for them is way bigger than it feels like it should be. There were so many times I felt like I was well outside a bomb's radius, and then got killed by it anyway. The other phases aren't as much of a problem, with the trickiest probably being the fourth phase, where Agent 3 retreats to a UFO. The problem with this phase is twofold. First, your gun can't really reach Agent 3 on top of their floating platform. If you jump while shooting just right, you can kind of hit them a little, but not reliably. The way to do this fight is by tossing a bomb up onto the platform. The problem with this is, because of how health recovery in Splatoon 2 works, you have to nail two or three bombs in a row, and if Agent 3 decides to attack while almost dead, you have to prioritize dodging. That means you're basically back at square one. The final phase is a bit easier than either Phase 3 or 4, but the main threat Agent 3 has here is the ability to periodically spam the splashdown move. It can be hard to tell with all of this action and movement going on on screen when this is up, so it's all too easy to get caught unaware and hit by splashdown, which is a guaranteed death. If you try to play conservatively, defensively, you'll never make it through Agent 3's passive health regeneration. So my best advice for this phase is to get aggressive as soon as the splashdown ends, and pray you get lucky and manage to kill them before you get got yourself. Look, please understand that I like hard games. I seek out hard games, those are the ones which tend to capture my interest. I've beaten Inner Agent 3 once for this video, you can see footage of me doing it here, and I will never do it again. I hate this fight. I hate it so much. I never want to do this fight again. My biggest issue with Inner Agent 3 is that it suddenly feels like it's testing you on a completely different skill set than the rest of the game is. Splatoon isn't built for this kind of NPC duel, and with the exception of the sanitized Agent 3 fight in the ending sequence, you've never been tested on your ability to fight in this kind of duel before or since. It's a non sequitur from all of the strengths which Octo Expansion had. The clever level design, the unique puzzle mechanics, the challenging platforming, every single thing that makes Octo Expansion great is completely absent from this fight. There's another optional challenge level at the end of Splatoon 3, and we'll talk about it when we get there, but I greatly prefer that level to the Inner Agent 3 fight. It's still really hard, dramatically more difficult than anything else in the game, but it isn't this sort of duel fight. It's an entire level, testing the player on each sort of challenge the game up to that point has faced the player with. I... I don't want to fight Inner Agent 3 again. Don't make me fight Inner Agent 3 again. I'm I'm not mad that I couldn't do it. You're not allowed to tell me I'm mad or just bad at Splatoon because look at the screen. I did it. I killed Inner Agent 3. I've got the toothpick to prove it. You can't make me do this fight again. None of you can make me do this fight again. Overall though, that fight aside, Octo Expansion is fantastic. I like the next campaign we're going to talk about a lot as well, but I think Octo Expansion edges it out just a bit. It's close, but I think this is the peak of Splatoon as a franchise so far for me. The fact that this came out of left field, single player DLC for a predominantly multiplayer shooter, and wound up being one of the best games on the Switch, is shocking. It really shows that the developers working on this project had real passion for the franchise, and a lot of amazing ideas they only needed to be let off the leash to go execute. Now, how do you follow that? How do you follow a campaign that has set the bar so high? Next time, we'll talk about Return of the Mammalians.